Well, folks, um, you know, following after some really good speaking and, and, and talks like that, I'm going to do my very best to uh, make you think a little bit more and, and hopefully consider the ideas of what we just heard and can I change them not with magnets, which is possible apparently, and we can do it with experience, but can we do it with pharmacology, better living through chemistry? Uh, the short answer is yes. The longer answer might be, should we? And what, is it, what does it mean? What are the ramifications of what we're doing? So we're talking about the idea of cosmetic neuropsychopharmacology. It's also been referred to as cosmetic neurology, cosmetic pharmacology, cosmetic neuropharmacology, or psychopharmacology. I use big words, sounds impressive, a lot of syllables, better living through chemistry. And we're not talking about treating pathology. We're talking about enhancing what we'll call normalcy. So let's go ahead and get started. That's me. And uh, get into our first slides here. A lot of things we want to cover, and it's going to talk about the possibility of enhanced cognition and if it's actually happening. And we're going to have to talk about perception about that as well. What about the other ideas? Normal. Can we do it? Should we do it? What are the ethics behind that? And are our decisions to do this sort of thing based on evidence, science, data? It's nice to know if it is. So let's go ahead and get to it. Now, clearly, this slide indicates that Einstein believed in this process and that it wouldn't be interesting to know if he used substances. Freud did. He was pretty smart, too. All right. Einstein is a genius, no question about it. Did he get some of that genius because he was using medical? By the way, this is a doctored slide. He didn't really pose for this. I hope you didn't believe that. But you saw it, so maybe it was true for you. Now, what else do we have to think about? The quest for better brains. The quest for better brains. Isn't that what we want? I mean, who doesn't want to be smarter? Who, who votes for being dumber? Who votes for making B's and C's instead of A's? What if making the B is the normal average grade and making the A sounds really good? We want to be smarter for a few reasons. There's a, a payoff to it, if you will, getting into school. And we have to talk about high stakes stuff, like high stakes exams. Undergraduate, I need to make A's on this biology test. I need to make A's on this psychology test because I need to make a good GPA so I can get into graduate school. And I got to take the GRE, and I got to take the MCATs or the PCATs, whatever admissions test for my graduate school or professional school. So I need to have good grades. I need it so bad because education, well, that translates to money. All right? And genetics is involved. Maybe I can't do much about that but can I enhance what I've already got? So are we just a, a sum, an average of our, of our, pay, of our uh, parents? Okay, but the dollar signs is really the key factor. It really is, because you go to college, you get a better job. You go to graduate school, you supposedly get a better job. You're <laughs> There's a diminishing return in case you won't figure that out. I'm telling you right now. I ask any assistant professor here at Nova Southeastern if they're getting paid what they paid. Okay. But the competitive edge, the competitive edge. I not only have to get into medical school, I have to beat out the person next to me trying to get into medical school. I have to be the valedictorian to get into medical school. All right. Now, what am I willing to do to do that? All right. Will I, will I cut a couple corners? Will I make myself better? And, and are I allowed to make myself better? Why can't I enhance myself? We do it through other reasons, other ways. If it can be done, why or why not? But you see, this problem has been around for quite some time. It's not just neuropsychopharmacology. We have other things to talk about. Steroids. Now, every professional athlete, every college athlete, has the ability to be randomly tested blood or urine for, say, steroids, all right? For some reason, our society seems to think it's not fair. Should Barry Bonds have a little asterisk by his name with all those home runs? 
because he had a little bit of enhancement when he did that. Should we know when our physicians are seeing us who took the Adderall in medical school and who didn't take the Adderall in medical school? Because maybe they were smarter then than they are now because, well, maybe they're still taking Adderall. Okay. Other lifestyle pharmacology, Botox, clearly, cosmetic, human growth hormone. My wife and I are having this debate right now. My wife cannot get her head around the idea that your children are usually the average height of the two parents. I'm 5'8", five 5'9", five on a good day, she's 5 feet. My kids are genetically designed to be 5'6", if they're lucky. Growth hormone might buy them 2 inches, 3 inches, at the cost of a mortgage, about two or 3,000 a month. It's done. All the growth hormone that has been developed is not to treat dwarfism, all right? The pharmaceutical companies know about this as well. So what else? Lifestyle pharmacology, some Viagra, an old drug, Yocon, an alpha-2 antagonist to increase norepinephrine, okay? Now, nicotine, caffeine, these are lifestyle medications. I am a fiend for Cuban coffee. If I don't have my Cuban coffee in the morning, I have trouble. And if I don't have it in two days, I have horrible rebound headaches. So don't tell me something physiologically is not going on. A lot of us might drink caffeine. It's a known stimulant, and it has some of the qualities that we're thinking about with these prescription medications as well. So any other lifestyle pharmacology products out there? Well, because of time, I'm going to go ahead and give you another one. Birth control pills. All right, that's lifestyle pharmacology. That's altering normal, okay? So some of us, maybe many of us, have practiced some form of pharmacological manipulation of normalcy to achieve uh, a goal, a lifestyle goal, maybe some other goal. You know, stave off having children while you're going through undergraduate and graduate school, okay? It's a goal because financially that's really tough. So what about what you're talking about now? The absence of pathology, what is normal? Now, if we think that normal is an IQ of 100, and by the way, it is, that's average, and who doesn't want to be a 130? By the way, 130 is not normal, but it's awfully good, okay? And if 130 is good, why can't I go for higher? Why can't I head toward genius? And if I can give you a medication that might get you an extra 5 or 10 or 15 points on that IQ test, or that functionality, that functional IQ, then why not do it? Why not do it? So again, there's a point of should we do it? Can we do it is already there. Should we do it is another question. But we all want to be a genius. At least I would like to think so. It generally makes better grades. The person generally does a little bit better on their writings and things like that. So the agents that we use and are using today for cognitive enhancement are classically the psychostimulants, the amphetamines, all right? They've been around for a long time. And you know, it's kind of interesting, you know, is the Pentagon calling about change in morality and things like that? The military leads, in most cases, this sort of research, all right? They developed the amphetamines. They were studying it in the pilots in the 30s and 40s and such and we're still using it, and a lot of the data that we can talk about is actually military application data. Okay, so why not? Why not? They've given us a lot of other, uh, who's got a GPS on their cell phone now, okay? Thank you, military. So we have a variety of agents that will pharmacologically increase or alter neurotransmitters in your brain. These brain regions that we've been hearing about and talking about, well, they're communicating through neurotransmitters. All right, I can enhance communication, maybe interactivity between certain regions of the brain by increasing the norepinephrine, increasing the acetylcholine, changing the dopamine, modulating the serotonin. These medications do that. Now, again, originally they were developed for pathology. We thought that some individuals, maybe with narcolepsy, they needed more excitatory neurotransmitters to stay awake. Okay, but what if you really want to stay awake? and you don't have narcolepsy. Will these agents work for you there? Yes. What if you have Alzheimer's disease and that hippocampal region involved with memory and recall and such, some aspects that we already heard about? What if I enhance the acetylcholine there? I'm not gonna 
reverse or actually treat the underlying causes of Alzheimer's disease. But I'm going to mitigate some of that by artificially enhancing acetylcholine, one of the neurotransmitters damaged based or not being created because of Alzheimer's disease. So I can do that. I can manipulate enzymes. I can cause a brain cell to increase the release of a neurotransmitter beyond its normal activity. And when we do that, things happen. Now, some things that might happen would be, well, we would increase attention. We would increase memory, or memory acquisition at least. And ideally, recall, because it's no good studying and memorizing something if you can't pull it out for the exam later on. So recall is pretty important too. Again, the agents that we're talking about are used for a variety of problems. Attention deficit? Oh my gosh, is it an epidemic sweeping this country or do we all have a level of attention deficit? And all those little computer gadgets in our classroom makes me think, yeah, maybe so. They're all ADD and they should be focused on my lecture, but they're checking Facebook and it's not about how awesome the lecture is, by the way. <laughs> they're checking things, they're doing other stuff, and everybody thinks they can multitask. Turns out you really can't multitask, but you think you can. Bad perception, all right? So, the things that we are supposed to be using these medications for. And again, we have true reasons that they're working. And we understand the pharmacology behind them. In almost every discussion of neuroenhancement with, say, psychostimulants, very rarely do they talk about the side effects. Now, sometimes, some drugs get into a lot of trouble when we overuse them. A drug like Adderall, some people may have heard of it, almost got pulled from this market, the United States market, because having problems. No drug come without a risk. You cannot have the perfect agent that can only do good things. By the very nature, by the very uh, way that it cr increases norepinephrine, it can increase your blood pressure and your heart rate. And now, what if you do have a stroke because of that? And that happens. That happens. Increasing norepinephrine? Well, norepinephrine is your attention neurotransmitter a little, maybe you should pay attention to the, your surroundings for fear of the uh, saber-toothed tiger that used to come around. So if I increase norepinephrine, I can make you anxious, all right? A little paranoid, and then eventually a little psychotic. Now does neuroenhancement sound so cool when you're in my state psychiatric hospital four miles down the road? It happens. It happens. So they're not without risk. They're not without risk. A lot of our patients are enjoying this sort of thing here. But they do have the data, at least in some populations. Maybe it's the disease populations, and again, we wouldn't use these medications for that purpose if we didn't have it. We know that they can increase attention. They can help with memory. They can help with vigilance and recall and things like that. That data is out there, and it's been out there for 50, 60, 70 years, all right? The Pentagon might give a pilot taken off somewhere in the middle of the United States, fly over, do a mission on the other side of the world. They don't land that plane, by the way. Those planes can actually go literally around the world. They'll take off in the United States, do their mission, and then they'll come down and land back in the United States. The, the serious bombers can do that. Well, they'll give them something to keep them awake while on flight, and then when they come down, they literally have to give them something to bring them down, another pharmacological agent to help them sleep. Now, other stu stuff, the Ritalin, methylphenidate, very ubiquitous, been around for a very long time. Now, why did methylphenidate become popular? Because it wasn't called amphetamines. It works the same way. It can still increase norepinephrine and dopamine. Ritalin became popular in the 70s and 80s because we didn't want little Timmy out on speed. We, dextroamphetamine has been used and is still used to this day. Um, some people have heard of the newer drug Vyvanse, for instance. They think Vyvanse is great. Dextroamphetamine, new name, changed the pH to an F, and apparently everybody forgets that it's amphetamine. So phonetically, it still sounds the same. By the way, there are negative studies out there. There really are. We have positive data, but we do have negative data. And as uh, mentioned in the last talk, sometimes the data is very minute, or at least the differences are very minute. All right. One of the negative studies I'm remembering is a University of Florida study. They looked at students at the University of Florida who had been sleep deprived, as if that's never happened before. 
and they study their ability to do task, attention, stay on task, complex task. They study their ability before and after the administration of Ritalin. Turned out there was no difference whether we gave them placebo or Ritalin. There was no statistical difference in their performance on these tests. So it's not always a sure-fired bet that you're going to be enhanced. You might simply get a headache. All right? So it, there are negative studies out there when it comes to what we'll call normal individuals. Modafinil is another agent that has um, kind of become popular in the last five to ten years. This agent, another application of military research in helicopter pilots, is one of the studies that showed that modafinil improved wakefulness, attention, memory, all right? good to have in a pilot, okay? So we do have data that says this agent used for narcolepsy, for instance, and extreme fatigue can improve some of these functions, okay? So modafinil is growing in popularity. The acetylcholinesterase inhibitors are the drugs for Alzheimer's disease, and in one interesting study, we actually saw, I'm gonna go ahead and move through this, we actually saw in airline pilots that when given a, this drug, denepazil, brand name Aricept, when given denepazil to enhance their acetylcholine, they performed better on emergencies. Shouldn't I require all professional commercial airline pilots now to be on this medication if they're going to do better as pilots? So there's a, a little question about that right there. By the way, they all drink coffee, so they're already doing something. So the medications are there. And we actually have seen another agent, very popular, nicotine. And we're de there's an entire drug company designed to create drugs that will work on nicotine receptors. Nicotine receptors. And they have been affecting other neurotransmitters the whole time. So some people may have heard epidemiologic data that individuals who smoke cigarettes have a lower incidence of Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. Now, I would say that they usually die before they have a chance to have Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. So let's not say it was the nicotine enhancing their brain. There's other things going on, OK? Caffeine, the most ubiquitous of all of them, has some data that says we can improve attention. We can stay awake to study. It's my favorite agent to stay awake and study with. And again, it's ubiquitous. Now, what about, well, what about the other issues, then, of using these agents? Um, who is using it? The question is, who is not using it is the, the harder question. Conservatively, 10% of college students are using psychostimulants or other agents. 20 to 30% might be a more accurate. This is a study we did here at Nova Southeastern. We looked at poker players. And about 27, 28% of the poker players professional or otherwise, are using stimulants or other agents, mostly psychostimulants, like amphetamines and Ritalin to do it, okay? And um, now, granted, if I went during finals week here at NSU and I asked for urine test and blood test to see if, uh, to see what's in your urine during finals week, what would I find? What would be the incidence of the students that I would find something in it? Now, if I asked for urine a week after finals week, it would be a completely different set of substances. <laughs> I'm just guessing on that. It's a hypothesis. We'll test one day. So we'll wrap it up with not that we can do it. Wrap it up with the idea of should we do it? What are the issues related to using pharmacological enhancement in the case of cosmetic neuropsychopharmacology. If I can improve your functions on a test, when does it stop? Does it stop in the undergraduate once you got into medical school? No, no, no. You got to be number one in medical school to get the residency. You got to stay awake in the residency to get the good fellowship. What about functionality after the fact? We could be, you can, if you can rationalize your high school student to make a good grade to get into college, you can then rationalize almost every exam becoming a high stakes exam. So it's a slippery slope when you ever ha you have these kind of discussions on what are we using them for and why do we use them for, and then sometimes forgetting about the safety issues. Okay? So 
I'm going to go ahead and stop there and leave us a little bit of time for questions. Uh, hopefully, if we don't have it now, then we'll talk about it a little bit afterwards after the programming. So thank you very much for your time.